Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you this evening, and, and thanks for the introduction, Susan. I hope I can li live up to that. Um, I have to find a comfortable place to talk so all of you can see. It's an interesting shape, but uh, room. But first, I wanted to, to tell you that I have spent most of my adult life in North Carolina, uh, living mostly in Raleigh and then in Chapel Hill. This is my first opportunity to actually live outside of that little cocoon in North Carolina and to, to live here for several days a week and get to know your community. And it's been very, very wonderful experience for me. I've gotten to meet many people who are out on the, the mall uh, doing their morning walks. I have several people that I now talk to, even in the dark, as we as we as they make their turns around so it's been very good and it's getting to know that community and through uh, Ryan Davalt who I think is a member of the uh, I guess it's the city council so Ryan takes every opportunity to let us know in the NRI about the great things that Kannapolis is doing and I applaud you all for having the vision that you have for about re in general, re re-energizing re as well as rethinking your community. So I, I was disappointed to see this construction go up because I, I couldn't get to the cafe anymore or the, uh, or the sandwich shop. But I understand what you're doing, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, and I, I thank uh, Mr. Murdoch for spending his money in the, the state of North Carolina for assisting this community uh, in a number of ways. <coughs> so. Uh, this is entitled, The Effects of Genes and Environment on Our Health. Uh, that title is very broad, as you can recognize, so we'll, we'll, we are going, I am going to attempt to drill down and give you some useful information, partly by using myself as an example, partly by telling you the work we're doing at the, the Nutrition Research Institute about rethinking how we use models, genetic models, t to help inform human health as well. Uh, I subtitled this, uh, Our 46 in Our Environment. That's a riff on my part for 23andMe. If you're familiar with the, uh, the company that uh, will take your saliva and sequence the DNA from the cells that are in that saliva to give you a, a footprint, if you will, of what your genes and your variants of those genes are for you. Uh, they say 23 because there are, three, there are 23 types of chromosomes. There's 22 autosomes and one sex chromosome in the 23. But actually, we're made up of 46 chromosomes. And you have to, we have to understand the interplay between both sets of and both chromosomes that we inherit. So tonight is about uh, about genetics. It's about her, uh, heredity and how we inherit that, and not only how we inherited it from our recent ancestors. A lot of what we experience today, in terms of genetic influence that we have with interacting with our environment, is actually deep ancestry, tens of thousands of years if you will, and there's good evidence for that. So I'm going to talk about that as well. Now, oh, I'm too quick. This is, uh, this fingerprint of fruits and vegetables and fish. I've searched this carefully. I can't find any burgers or fries in it <laughs> at all. So I, I think it's trying to tell us that we have a genetic predisposition to, to have optimal health from certain nutrients. And when our nutrients are insufficient, we can have potential problems. And we may be able to overcome that by understanding exactly what optimizes our health through, through nutrition. Reminds me that that is a fingerprint, actually, because like nutrition, our 
fingerprint, at least the pattern of the fingerprint, is genetically inherited. The major, the whirl, as shown here, we inherit from our ancestors. Now, the focus, as Susan has already described for you, is uh, on why do, why do metabolism and nutrition differ between people? Inter individual variations are significant. And how do we use information by identifying how our genes and our environment changes our response to nutrition? This picture actually shows you the diversity of the human population. This might be a subsample, but we see people of all sizes and shapes and ethnic backgrounds, which make up the human population. And it's understanding why some of us are predisposed to lung cancer when we never have smoked in our life. Why some others may, why do some of us have more issues with uh, weight gain than others? And why do we have certain patterns of weight gain, etc.? There are many things that we, that we can actually try to understand from this. At the NRI, there's a large number of faculty uh, that uh, are involved in a number of areas of research that, that impinge upon uh, nutrition and health. And I'm going to talk uh, at the end a bit about the work that we're starting with uh, Steve Hursting, a uh, uh, professor at Chapel Hill at, at the NRI, on his work in obesity and cancer. Uh, Susan has already mentioned her work on fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorders. Uh, and uh, also with Katie Meyer, who is here on uh, the role of nutrition in, in, in heart disease. And I'm focusing on these three because we have started some new studies this year using a mouse model to help inform the translation to human studies. And you might say, why mice? Well, I'm going to try to make a story of that and try to help you understand how the house mouse is actually a commensal to human. Our adaptation over many thousands of years parallels that of the mouse because the, the house mouse in particular has lived off what remains of, the, of human uh, nutrition, grains, etc., over, over time. And there's a, there's a lot of difference between a mouse and a human, but there's a lot of similarities that we can capitalize on at the same time. Now, to do this, I'm going to tell you a bit of, about my history of my family and use myself as an example for this. And this will be basically a primer, if you will, of, of, how, of how I see heredity and genes and how genes differ between us, if you will. So I will start here with uh, my grandparents. Uh, on the, this is on the, on, to your left side here. That's my uh, paternal generation. And on the right side is my maternal generation generation. And this starts back with uh, Ed, uh, Edgar Franklin French here and his wife, Eula Mae Shul. And this is John uh, H. Uh, Tunison and uh, Rilla Reed. Now they all actually, this was, this generation of mine was living mostly in Louisiana and New Orleans at the time. And their immediate ancestors and this side uh, came from Ireland and from uh, Germany. And this side here came from um, uh, through Amsterdam from Copenhagen. This is sort of the Danish side of the family. And this is more of the Irish German side of the family. And in this picture, I'm going to point out that th these two chromosomes, th this is a symbol of a chromosome. And these two are autosomes just one of the 22 pairs of autosomes that we all inherit. And then there's a sex chromosome, of course, uh, and this would be from a, uh, uh, a uh, this would actually should be two, it should be an XY here, and this would be an XX here. So, we, and then this circular structure shown here is, is the, the, the DNA of a mitochondrion. If you're not familiar with the mitochondrion, the way in which we use oxygen to make to produce ATP, which is a form of energy that the cells in the body can use, um, that's where it occurs. 
but the DNA of that has its, is a fe of female origin, and therefore this can tell us about our female lineage over time. Um, and that's what we'll use at that. So uh, this is my father, George Lewis French, who, uh, in my mind, who uh, was the third child of, uh, of Edgar and Eula May. And uh, they inherited combinations of chromosomes from their, their parents on, on both the paternal side and the maternal side. And then this is me down here, uh, a male, I think. Uh, XY, uh, and this is my mother's mitochondrial DNA. Uh, mitochondria in here, and that represents her, the, the DNA she inherited uh, from her mother here in, vice, in back. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Um, so moving forward, we're dealing at this stage in science in this country and around the world with trying to incorporate some big ideas. And these big ideas can be uh, overwhelming at times. Uh, I'm bad with these buttons. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so one concept is the genome. I showed you the picture of the, ind the individuals. Well, each, each, each of us has our own genome. So we're unique. Uh, there's some overlap, there's some similarities with our immediate ancestors, but by and large the population is all genetically different. Um, and I'll point out that, I, I probably will come back to this in a, in a moment, but basically we have three billion nucleotides. Our DNA is made from four nucleotides, adenine, uh, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And I'm going to show you some of these in terms of using a letter for each to show you what a nucleotide looks like and how they're arranged in, in the linear sequence in the DNA. But these, these chromosomes are all compacted. This is not the way the, set, the chromosomes exist in the cell uh, when it's in an interface dependent state, when it's actually doing the work that it does to keep the body going. It only becomes condensed like this when the cell is getting ready to divide. Uh, in, the, uh, in the somatic cells of the body, uh, that remains in what the diploid condition, that's the 46 chromosomes. But uh, in, the, in the testes and in the, in the uh, ova, they undergo a haploid uh, uh, reduction, and there, there is only 23 uh, chromosomes in that context. So that's, I wanted to point, be, be sure that's clear. But not only do we have a genome, we have an epigenome. Well, so you might ask, what's an epigenome? Well, there are sequences in our DNA, there are runs of cytosines and guanines that are together that can be methylated. And when they are methylated by certain processes, they can actually be stopped from participating in the life of the cell. They can become uh, uh, quiescent, if you will. So that's become, along with the proteins uh, called histones, the epigenome uh, is a dynamic inheritance that we receive. So we receive both forms. We receive this genome and we receive it, the epigenome, but the epigenome is largely influenced by the environment. The genome itself is not, except maybe under conditions where you're exposed to in certain toxicants that can damage the DNA and cause mutations, which can also be caused by enhanced inflammation in the body because of all of the uh, uh, oxygen species that can be generated. So we have that. We have to be, we have to, boy, this is going to get me up. All right. Um, so there's the, those are two big, and then we have, when I just mentioned the things that can do damage to our DNA, my, my thumb is twitchy, all right? <coughs> no? Oh, boy. One more try, all right. 
exposome is the actual, your life history of things that you're exposed to that can do damage to you, that can be irradiation. It's not without consequence when we go to the doctor and we have an x-ray, uh, we receive some DNA damage. It's minimal and usually can be repaired. But with, at some level, at higher doses, over, which is, that can be acquired over time, that can be damaging. So it's the actual collection of the, hi of the life history of that, that that a number of scientists are trying to deal with and trying to, to understand how that is influencing um, the expo the, uh, both the epigenome and the genome. And then we have this microbiome. Anyone know what the microbiome is that everybody's talking about in science these days? Well, that is another commensal. I said the mouse was a commensal, but you're actually carrying around around uh, 100 trillion bacteria on your surface of your skin and in your on in your gut, if you will, what we, which we can inarticulately call your gut microbiota. Uh, 100 trillion of those, about five to 700 species, we all carry. That's actually largely inherited at the beginning of our life from our mother, but that can be affected by what we eat over our lifetime, etc. cetera. Um, and then um, that, we're host to that microbiome, if you will, and that, and that microbiome, uh, we only have about, I said, I think, uh, three billion nucleotides. We have about 25,000 genes that we know of. We still, at this day and age, we're still trying to understand what a gene is, actually, and, and exactly uh, how to identify them. Because sometimes they overlap, and don't, they, they, it, it, I don't want to go there. It's just too much. <laughs> anyway, but the my, microbiome has a tremendous impact on our health and our nutrition. So we have to be good to our microbiome. A lot of people like to take probiotics for that. Uh, to keep it healthy, because after we've had a, a, um, a, an, a, a an intestinal bug that's made us sick and we, uh, we have eliminated, it has to regrow to some extent. So helping that along by taking probiotics can be very helpful. Okay, so those are three big concepts. This is a, my a part of the primer. Let me go ahead and move forward uh, with that. And this is, what, so when I say, talk about the sequence of DNA, I'm going to use terms, I have to, I have to do this because there's no other way that for me to get through these concepts. And that's to actually talk about single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are SNPs for short, if you will. You're going to be a geneticist when we get through tonight. Uh, and then there are structural polymorphisms. Uh, in, in, so in addition to these, you can, uh, maybe you can see, these are color-coded, so you can just probably see that there's A's and T's and C's and G's. And this is actually uh, one part of the, uh, this is one chromosome running from the five prime to the three prime. And here's the other one here. And I'm not going, I just want to get you the sense, get you the mental image that we're talking about long sequences of these nucleotides and inside that contains the information that our body uses to direct our functions. Uh, and we call these uh, genetic variants, or allelic variants, and I'm going to go more into this. Now, I wanted to point out, to be sure that we're all on the same page, that that chromosome is condensed, it actually is condensed, it's hard to get three billion nucleotides into a chromosome in each one of these. So it's actually coiled around uh, these protein cores here, and this is the actual sequence. And it is this sequence that, that makes a gene. And a gene has a starting position and a, and a final and a stopping position that's based on what types of nucleotides are at each end of that gene, if you will. And the gene has to, un to, be un to separate itself, unwind itself to be actually expressed. And that, of course, occurs in a cell. And I wanted to point out that in the, in the cell, the genes, all, 20, all 46 of them, are actually spatially oriented 
But it's not random. They actually prefer a certain position against other chromosomes at two because there's crosstalk at this level. Okay, now maybe I'm getting too deep. Um, now, I want to spend the next part talking about a... Uh, this is a service. The NRI has its own genotyping platform for helping us understand uh, what, how our genes and the uh, variants that we have in our genes that are affect, affect nutrition. Uh, the National Geographic Project that first started out using what we call a, a genotyping platform and they wanted to look at deep ancestry. They wanted to try to understand where people come from, how they moved about the world to repopulate the world, etc. Uh, in this context. So now it's, mo it's moved up in, into the Geno2. And the Geno2 is a very powerful platform because uh, it actually sequences the exomes of the DNA. So you can get a complete readout. To give you an example of how important this is, uh, when we finished sequencing the human genome uh, decades ago, it, was, it cost $2.7 billion to sequence the, com the compiled genome of about six individuals, all mixed together. Um, $2.7 billion. That was done in by two groups, actually. Uh, there was the, uh, the, the federal government participated. This was your tax dollars at work. Uh, the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Energy uh, did the public sequence. Uh, a guy named Craig Venter, who was, uh, had a falling out with his... Uh, his supervisor at the NIH and went out and did this on his own with private funds. Uh, he did it for less, yes, he did it for less. <laughs> but he only, he used what was called a shotgun procedure. So he had to spend a long time putting it all back together because they used different techniques. But, but the two, in the end, made a, had a tremendous impact on, medicine, on our understanding of genetics and medicine. Now, I told you I was about deep ancestry. So from my genome uh, that was sequenced, I know that uh, from the mitochondrial DNA and from the Y chromosome, I know that my father's haplogroup uh, was RZ2 and that that shows in this orange area, this is where that haplotype where that haplogroup originated here. Uh, and if, you point, if you can see this, this is actually with Spain way down here. This is Central Europe. Uh, here's the Middle East over here. This is Central Europe, the northern countries, uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia up here. So that RZ2 arose in the human population here in uh, eastern uh, uh, Europe. My mother's, based on the mitochondrial work, was an H1. This was one of the earliest ones that arose. It arose uh, in, the, in the Middle East. Why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because we can, we've been able to track the origin of genes that arose from, in this area, from, from archival tissues of, of, of very, very aged, long, thousands, of, tens of thousands of years uh, and, and show where these originate. Now, my father's uh, group here, uh, RZ2, arose up here. My mother's down here. This, this shows you patterns of migration that occurred very early, tens of thousands of years ago. So my point is, is that as humans spread out over the face of the earth, they were mostly hunter-gatherers. You've heard that term, I'm sure, by now, because a lot of us have gotten into the paleo diet. People will talk about the paleo diet, and they're talking about the diets that our ancestors used and how they adapted to, and, and that's, so maybe I should do the paleo diet because that will help me lose weight, 
etc. Because I'll go back to the diet I should be eating to begin with, and not all this modern stuff. Uh, so that occurred. And the point I want to make to you is that as they moved uh, throughout, they spread one possible pathway, and I can tell you from what my ancestors came, they originated here and here, and somehow it, I, can, I have evidence that my mother, mother's ancestors moved into Central Europe here. My father's uh, 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 took this path around for some reason up into the Arctic and back down into to Norway before they spread out both in to the east and to the uh, to the west. Now, how do I know that? Well, I know that because I have variants, allelic variants in my genome, where 56 up of them, 56 percent of those come from the British Isles. 32 percent comes from uh, southwestern Europe, and this this area around the Mediterranean. 8%, I was shocked at this, 8% of mine came from, uh, from uh, Western Russia, uh, around this, this region here. This is where the Karelians uh, first came from. These were the ancestors of the parts of the Finnish people here. And then I have 3% here from Eastern Europe. Now, this does not mean that that's the same kinds of genomes that the modern inhabitants of those areas have, that this is where they originated if you will. So this gives me a, a bit. Now I can tell you that my wife, who is a Finn, uh, is, is, is a 99 and a half percent <laughs> from here. And that was just a sheer stroke of luck that we happened to come up. <laughs> and she said, well, maybe that's why I'm compatible with you. I never thought I would be. But... <laughs> okay. So maybe, maybe not only affects nutrition, it affects other things as well. Okay, now in terms of the deep ancestry, these of a million people who have t done this test with Genographic Two uh, of the of, of the paternal line, uh, only I share that with 1.8 percent of, of that S that sample of the world's population, and about three uh, percent with the maternal. So genetics can be actually entertaining. And you can use it to study genealogy. And you can learn about your most recent ancestors. And you can learn about your deep ancestors. Um, OK, now back to the paleo diets. And why I'm going in this direction is because we've had a very nice little uh, snacks out here, very healthy. Uh, but think about what our ancestors were faced with as they were hunter-gatherers and before they some had, were smart enough to settle down and actually start farming. And that was a different adaptive pressure. There were pre different pressures as in the early, uh, the deep parts of, of the migration versus the later parts. This shows of current hunter-gatherers um, around the world. You can't see this so much down here, but I can tell you that the, in Nuit, you're no, in the, uh, from the north, north, uh, north Canada, that live around the, the, uh, side, the, uh, the, the coastline, eat a diet of basically 100% meat and fish, whales and fish from the sea. The uh, Hiwi, uh, mostly meat and fish, but only a bit of vegetables. And some um, uh, roots, root vegetables, and then the the kung here from uh, South Africa eat primarily a mixture of grains, seeds and nuts, roots, fruits and vegetables, and meat and fish. A lot of what we do today in that context. Whereas the Hadza from uh, mid the Middle East actually have a, 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 a diet that varies from including meat and fish and fruits and vegetables. So which paleo diet would you choose if you're going to do that? Because you, you don't know which, and we don't know exactly, we have very little information about you know, 10,000 years ago what they were actually eating, but we can imagine what were they eating because we can understand what in the, in the uh, geologic record what kind of plants and etc. they were. Okay, let me move on. Now, I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of my own background because this is where we're getting into precision nutrition 
if you will. Uh, so I know that I have a, a very high tolerance for alcohol. I guess that's good. I, I don't know. Uh, but I, I, it's also, because I know that based on large genome-wide association studies that where they're sampling thousands of individuals, they, the epidemiologist can show that there is a reduction in uh, esophageal cancer. So that's protective. That's a good thing. Uh, that comes from this gene, this variant here, alcohol dehydrogenase 1b. And that is the particular SNP. That's an RS number. But the variant in that my DNA backbone, it's this specific uh, uh, genomic position is an AG. Now there, so that you can be AA, AG, or GG. There's three variants to this. There's three possible combinations. I also know that I have, uh, and this is a good thing too for me because I have, uh, I metabolize caffeine rapidly. That's good. It means I drink a lot of coffee. Uh, but also it's very interesting, and this is the, this is a cytochrome P451A2. Well, that's good because that is one of the major detoxification enzymes against uh, foreign compounds. So that's protective. Uh, and it gives me a high metabolism. And that high metabolism in caffeine means that I can metabolize toxicants that I get exposed to. Uh, but, and I drink a lot of coffee because it, it, this, since it metabolizes so fast, it's less stimulating to me. My point is that you can get information that's useful from knowing what your genetic variants are. Uh, uh, but maybe we've got to the point where we don't really care anymore. But I was particularly interested <laughs> in this for myself uh, because I have struggled with weight all my life. Uh, I was doing fine until I was about 12 years of age and I just, poof. And it took uh, many years and many miles of running 50 miles a week sometimes, to, to get that under control. So I was very interested that from, from, genome, from these GWAS studies that I could learn something about why I am predisposed to gain adipose tissue around my waist. The, the, you think scientists would have something better to do, but that's what they do. <laughs> anyway, it, it can actually have, because there's a correlation with that between your, 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 longe your health and your longevity. So this shows you quickly in a pattern. I hope you can see this, uh, and I'm not standing in your way. I can, sh I can show you that I am predisposed, I know I, with a, and I understand the genetic basis for that, I am predisposed to having weight gain from saturated fat. And all my life I've loved saturated fat. I've, I love bacon and everything else. And these are the genes. This is an apolipoprotein variant, and this this is clever, this FTO gene is cleverly named, it's, it's the fat obese gene. Right? They were really smart. And so these variants, and these are the specific variants that I have in my genome that predispose me to this condition. And then I also am less uh, predisposed, past the median down here, for weight gain from carbohydrates. So I think I'm getting the message here that I should be eating more carbohydrates than I do fat. So, this is an inter-individual difference, if you will. And these are the genes, and I'm not going to, to bore, bore you with it, but and these are the genotypes that I, that I carry. Now, the bottom line, though, for me, in terms of uh, my dietary fat intake and what I'm predisposed to gain weight, I am, uh, based on this set of variants, Apoli protein, this transcript factor, the fat obese gene, and tumor necrosis factor, these particular sets of variants predispose me very high to weight gain from this. It's good for me to know that because I'm going to change some things. I've been trying to change some things about that. Now, if I take all of those five genes, six genes, and actually do some clever informatics with that, I actually can 
find out all of the variants that actually go into causing this, and that's what this little figure here shows you. These are the five genes that I know the variants from, and when I look in the literature and I can associate that with all the genes that they interact with, I know that, that my variants cause me to have differences in the way which I metabolize fat and how my fat is packaged and how fast I can get rid of it when I am under, in it, when I, I have to go almost ketogenic uh, to, be, to, to lose weight in this context. So we can do clever things, but, and, and we hopefully it has uh, some, some meaning. Now, uh, how am I, Rick, how am I doing on time? I've lost track of all of what I was doing. It's 6.40? Okay. All right. 6.40, really? I'm having too much fun, I guess. Uh, I have to speed up. Uh, well, okay, I talk too much, I guess. Anyway, so there's a big issue we have in science right now about how do we model this inter-individual difference between humans. Because as public health scientists, we basically operate by what's called the precautionary principle. We want to do things without causing any harm first. And sometimes when drug companies uh, get, go too fast and they put things in the, to the market too fast and haven't done due diligence, uh, they can, we can do harm. And uh, many drugs have been having taken off the market because they didn't understand the genetic effects of that. Well, to do that now, we're using mouse models to try to translate to human. I'll speed up. Okay, now why do we need these kinds of studies? Well, the human population uh, shows vast genetic differences around the world. And many of these genetic differences are unique to the continent and unique to the population within the continent. We're quite diverse. Uh, and there's about uh, 68 million single nucleotide polymorphic variants around the world. But the world is becoming smaller, and there's a much more mixing of these genes now. So it's more difficult uh, to understand exactly the impact of all of these. But we have a, a model in the mouse that comes from the same regions of the world to do that. And I show you that here. These are the, there are three subspecies of mice shown here. And um, the, uh, this is mus, musculus, it's, this is uh, domesticus, this is castaneus, and this is uh, 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 musculus. And we have done something extraordinary. We have recreated the mouse by, by, re, by interbreeding eight different strains of these mice to create a mouse that we can actually believe has some relevance in terms with some differences too, genetically, that we can actually use this mouse to understand more about uh, the human condition. And we can do that by, I propose that we can do that by testing chemicals in these diverse mouse populations and actually learn more about the pharmacokinetics and more about the effect on disease, starting with the mouse, and use that to translate to the human. So we're using at the NRI. This is I'm, I'm getting. I'm going to go quickly and get through this. We're using a, these what's called collaborative cross mice, or, in, or the diversity outbred mice. Their genomes are very similar in construction to the human. They have they have different genes, but by and large, the pathways, the intermediary metabolism pathways, the nutrient pathways that are involved in this are similar, and we can use these to help understand and actually translate that into human medicine. And one study that was done at the NRI in the past few years by Brian Bennett before he moved to California, he was able to show using this mouse population that if he took cholesterol as a phenotype here, and he, this, he could identify a, this APOBEC2 one gene as a candidate for atherosclerosis. So if you're on a high-fat diet, uh, you can predispose yourself to atherosclerosis. There's nothing new about that, but what it shows here is that we can use a mouse model before to test things in the mouse before we test them in a human. Okay, and then 
this is complex, and I'm not, the only point I want to make is, to you is that this shows that this mouse, the founder of that haplotype of that mouse, this AJ mouse, actually had allylic variants. That when you did a statistical association between the high cholesterol and the, and the presence of atherosclerosis, that, that statistical association is what allowed you to identify on the genome um, what that uh, gene is and what variants cause that. In, in this context. Now that's one, and most of these kind of diseases are complex, they're multigenic, they're not single gene effects, but this, this explains a large effect of, of that high cholesterol diet uh, in, the, in the mice, and, we, and it turns out to be very similar in humans. Genome-wide association studies in humans identify that as of one of the five major causes of atherosclerosis uh, in humans. So we're expanding this, mount, this model, use of this model at the NRI. Steve Hursting is looking at uh, the, obese, the relationship between obesity, chemotherapeutic resistance, and mammary gland cancer. Uh, with his team there, he has another team of scientists in Chapel Hill doing this too. They can look at a n number of factors, including uh, uh, the, how much we eat, we can, identifying the, the level of insulin and insulin growth factor, different inflammatory proteins, etc., cetera, to, to study this link using this mouse model. And the question is, can we use it to inform human health? Uh, Dr. Smith, Professor Smith has shown, uh, and I think she's already talked about this before, but she has shown already that uh, alcohol exposure at certain levels can cause cell death uh, in utero when, when, when it's mistakenly taken during that time, and she is now using a collaborative cross mice to help her understand this fetal syndrome disorder. And then uh, Katie Meyer, who's an epidemiologist, is working with her team to look at the role of the gut microbiota I told you about earlier, and a particular metabolite of the gut microbiota, the gut microbiota that actually you can find in, our, in your urine uh, so it is a bacterial factor that we absorb, and it can have a positive effect on our metabolism. That's why the microbiome is so important. Okay, and I'll finish up by, this is the director of whom I know you know, Steve Zizel, and we, our beautiful facility across the, over here. So that's my take quickly, uh, not so quickly, it, it took a long time to get to the, the, the punchline. But... Uh, uh, this is an excellent facility to pursue these kinds of studies. It's in an excellent community that, that, that you support, which I find very, very helpful. And uh, Steve is, uh, is very good about uh, managing us all and keeping us on the right track. So thank you for listening. I hope I w didn't bore you too much. <laughs>